Hello and welcome to News at 10 on Rajya Sabha TV. I am Ashwarya Kapoor with you. Well, our top focus is Pakistan has been isolated after India more nations pull out of the SARC summit. That, uh, th that's the big story we'll be tracking. Also, the top international news is Simon Peres, uh, former Israeli Prime Minister and President, has died after suffering a stroke. All the details to follow. Let us begin with the other top stories in the headlines. India decides to boycott upcoming SARC summit in Islamabad in the wake of the Uri attack. Pakistan calls development unfortunate. Pakistan says revocation of Indus Waters Treaty will be treated as an act of war. This after Prime Minister holds review meeting on the matter, meeting on Thursday to review most favoured nation status to Pakistan. India and Nigeria sign MOU on development of bilateral trade during Vice President's visit. Mohammed Hamid Ansari underscores needs to synergize its growth strategies with Nigeria in the backdrop of global financial situation. Karnataka Chief Minister convenes all party meeting to discuss and decide on Supreme Court order to release water to Tamil Nadu. Karnataka maintains that drinking water is a priority. And one of Israel's defining political figures, Shimon Peres, is no more. Nobel laureate suffered a stroke two weeks ago. He was 93. The top story this morning, India has decided to boycott the SARC summit that is going to be held in Islamabad in the month of November. Well, the decision is a fallout of the Uri terror attack and India's attempt uh, to isolate Pakistan internationally over the issue of terrorism. Now, Pakistan has uh, called the development unfortunate and in the reports uh, just coming in, uh, they say that after India's decision, three other members, uh, Bangladesh, Afghanistan and Bhutan, have also decided to pull out of the meet. A big diplomatic fallout of the Uri attack. India decides to boycott the SARC summit slated to be held in November this year in Islamabad. In the prevailing circumstances, the government of India is unable to participate in the proposed summit in Islamabad. India conveying its decision to the current SARC chair Nepal, New Delhi stating one member country is responsible for creating an environment that is not conducive for successfully holding the summit. The 19th SARC summit is to be held from November 9 to 10. India has conveyed to the current SARC chair Nepal that increasing cross-border terrorist attacks in the region and growing interference in the internal affairs of member states by one country have created an environment that is not conducive to the successful holding of the 19th SARC summit in Islamabad in November 2016. Pakistan terming India's decision unfortunate. The Pakistan Foreign Office spokesperson in a late-night statement blaming India for interfering in its internal matters. Islamabad also stating it remains committed to regional peace and cooperation. The developments coming on a day when Foreign Secretary S.J. Shankar issued a second demarche in less than 10 days to Pakistan High Commissioner Abdul Basit over the Uri attack. India confronting Pakistan with proof of cross-border origins of the attack in which 18 Indian Jawans were killed. India informing Pakistan that preliminary interrogation has revealed the identity of one of the slain attackers. मेरा क्या कहना है कि बजाय इसके क्या भी कहना मैं नहीं जाऊंगा आप पूरे सार्क मेंबर्स पे दबाव डालिए और पूरे सार्क मेंबर्स को इस बात के लिए तैयार करिए कि इस्लामाबाद का वेन्यू बदला जाए सार्क नहीं खत्म करना सार्क एक इम्पोर्टेंट फोरम है लेकिन इस्लामाबाद जो में नहीं होना चाहिए दूसरी जगह वेन्यू शिफ्ट किया जाए ये उन्हें दबाव बनाना चाहिए अगर उसमें भारत सफल होता तब मैं मानूँ कि सरकार ने कुछ किया Reports coming in say Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Bhutan will be skipping the SARC summit to be held in Pakistan. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. On to some other news, well, Pakistan has said that the revocation of the Indus Waters Treaty will be taken as an act of war. Islamabad has also approached the World Bank after India's move to review the decades-old treaty. Earlier, Prime Minister Narendra Modi held a review meeting on Monday over the matter in which he stated that blood and water cannot flow together. Its revocation can be taken as an act of war or a hostile act against Pakistan. It is highly irresponsible on part of India to even consider revocation of the Indus Water Treaty. Unilateral revocation of IWP can pose a, a threat to Pakistan and its economy. This Indian act can be taken as a breach of international peace and hence giving Pakistan a good reason to approach the UN Security Council Pakistan reacting to India's move to review the Indus Waters Treaty. 
Prime Minister Narendra Modi had chaired a high-level meeting on Monday to review the decades-old treaty in which he said blood and water can't flow together. Pakistan alleging the threats are a tactic by New Delhi to divert attention from the issues in Kashmir. He provocated statements and actions from the Indian uh, leadership to, for uh, considering unilateral con- revocation of the Indus Water Treaty are a blatant violation of international law and also constitute a breach of the Indus Water Treaty. Threats of water war are a part of a military, economic and diplomatic campaign to build pressure on Pakistan in the wake of our efforts to expose Indian savageries in the Indian-occupied Kashmir since July 8, 2016. Pakistan also approaching the World Bank over the matter. A delegation of the Pakistan government, led by the Attorney General of Pakistan, Ashtar Osavali, met with senior officials of the World Bank at the World Bank headquarters in Washington, D.C. The World Bank had mediated the water-sharing deal. जंग हल नहीं है मसले का ये ऐसी स्टेटमेंट्स देनी भी नहीं चाहिए कि ये जो इंडस वाटर ट्रीटी से हम पीछे निकल जाएंगे क्या वो समझेंगे कि आप पानी अगर बंद कर दिया तो लोग चुप करके बैठे रहेंगे इसका बहुत बड़ा रिएक्शन आएगा Under the treaty which was signed by then Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru and then Pakistani President Ayub Khan in September 1960 waters of six rivers Bias Ravi Satluj Indus Chenab and Jhelum were to be shared between the two countries The treaty provides specific design criteria for any hydroelectric power plants to be built by India. Pakistan has held the position that the Kishan Ganga and Ratle hydroelectric plants violate the design parameters of the treaty. There has been pressure in India to reconsider the treaty in the wake of the Uri attack. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, India is also exerting pressure on Pakistan with the possibility of uh, withdrawing the most favoured nation status to the neighbour. To put this into effect, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has the call a meeting of top government officials on uh, Thursday. Now, if uh, India does revoke the MFN or the most favoured nation status given to Pakistan, it will mean diminished imports from that country. Here are all the details. Tightening the screws on Pakistan. A day after he reviewed the Indus Water Act treaty, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has called for another high-level meeting on Thursday. This time to take a good hard look at the most favored nation status granted to Pakistan. The high-level meeting will have top officials of the PMO, the MEA and the Commerce Ministry. India gave Pakistan the most favored nation status in 1996. Pakistan did agree to reciprocate at a secretary level agreement in 2012. but so far it has not kept its promise although experts say that even if india withdraws the status the impact will be mainly symbolic since bilateral trade between the neighbors represents only a fraction of india's overall goods trade if we scrap the mfn uh, which is part of our obligation under the wto um, it will uh, affect pakistani exports to india because uh, and uh, because um, then india would be able to apply higher tariffs uh, than that than uh, what we do for other countries because mfn simply means that uh, we give the same tariff uh, treatment to all countries india has never reviewed any of these arrangements with pakistan because india has always thought pakistan a brother or a friend and in order to increase the relationships among the uh, sar countries they gave the unilaterally the mfn treatment to pakistan they also gave a very liberal agreement to pakistan on the world under the world bank auspices for indus water treaty and that was long time ago in 1960 immediately there was war in 65 there was war in 71 and generally under the law of treaties the rule is that once the war takes place and all the treaties are defunct after that you know, everything has to be reviewed we have never done that so it is really a unilateral gesture which has been going on on the part of india so we have for the first time we feel that it should be uh, necessary to review all these arrangements and see what will be in the interest of india what will be the interest of the region and what will be india's obligations to the international community opposition parties however say withdrawing the mfn status might not be enough the congress is calling for imposition of economic sanctions as well on pakistan we've heard a lot of uh, speeches rhetorics meetings visual of meetings and unofficial press briefings what is the concrete action being taken against prime minister is what india wants to understand and know from the prime minister we had pointed out on day 
three actions needs to be taken isolate pakistan diplomatically ensure economic sanctions come from countries which are uh, be, uh, are financing pakistan thirdly ensure that there is a decisive specific precise and a proper and a fitting strategic response modi government has failed to do all three the mfn status allows pakistan give equal treatment in terms of trading prices or tariffs and market access without discrimination in imports and exports but out of india's total merchandise trade of 641 billion dollars in 2015-16 pakistan accounted for a mere 2.67 billion dollars india's exports to the neighboring country worked out to 2.17 billion dollars or 0.83% of the total indian outward shipments while imports were less than 500 million dollars or just 0.13% of the total inward shipments withdrawal of mfn status from pakistan is not more than notional because pakistan has little to sell to india but it will be interesting to see how prime minister narendra modi assesses the situation if pakistan retaliates by putting an embargo on indian goods akhilesh suman for raj sabha television in delhi Or some other news well India and China on Tuesday held talks on enhancing cooperation on counter terrorism as officials from both the countries met in their first high level dialogue in Beijing while well, the meeting comes at 10 days after a terror attack at the army base in Jammu and Kashmir's Uri district in which 18 Indian soldiers were killed the meeting was co-chaired co-chaired by RN Ravi chairman of the joint intelligence committee and Wang Yong King the secretary general of the central political and legal affairs commission of China Well, the two sides exchanged views on the international and regional security situation they also shared information on respective policies systems and legislation to deal with terrorism further enhancing their understanding on issues of major concerns to both the sides and india has urged nigeria to use its influence as a member of the organization of islamic cooperation to speak against terrorism in the world Now, Vice President Muhammad Hamid Ansari, who is in Nigeria, said that terrorist networks are becoming global networks, and there is a need to have a solid system in place on exchange of information. Now, international organization OIC consists of 57 Muslim states, including Nigeria and Pakistan. Meanwhile, India and Nigeria signed an MOU on development of bilateral trade on Tuesday. Here are the details. On OIC, well, President made a very strong pitch. Uh, and he said that uh, <clears throat> nigeria as an influential member of oic needs to speak up like all other members need to speak up at oic so that the entire agenda and the and the discourse is not sort of hijacked by one uh, interested party Underscoring the need for economic cooperation for development, Vice President Mohammad Hamid Ansari on Tuesday said India and Nigeria should work together to synergize their growth strategies for positive economic growth. At the Nigeria India Forum in capital Abuja, the Vice President called Nigeria an important partner for India's energy security requirement. India is the largest buyer of crude oil from the African nation with more than 100 Indian companies importing about 12% of India's crude oil requirement. There are significant potential for diversifying our engagement in oil and gas sectors by enhancing our cooperation in both upstream and downstream domains. Ansari pitched for foreign investment opportunities in India, hailing India's initiatives like smart city projects and digital India along with 7% economic growth in the last quarter. The vice president also emphasized on the need for expanding trade in the areas of automobiles, information technology, pharmaceuticals, biotechnology and healthcare sectors. Nigerian President Muhammadu Buhari welcomed the proposed investment of 5 billion US dollars in the Nigerian economy by India. India and Nigeria also signed an agreement to improve bilateral trade. It is a matter of satisfaction that for the last few years India has been the largest trading partner of Nigeria and Nigeria is the largest trading partner of India in Africa. Our bilateral trade has been growing steadily for the last one decade and touched 
US dollars 16 billion in the year 2014-15. A development that will no doubt give a major boost to our efforts in this regard. Let me state that while the Nigerian economy is now facing challenges of a structural nature, we are fully confident that we shall return to positive growth very soon. On the second leg of his two-nation visit to Nigeria and Mali, Vice President will reach Mali on 29th of September for the first ever high-level visit at the invitation of the country's Prime Minister. Vice President Ansari arrived in Nigeria on Monday as part of efforts to bolster India's ties with the West African nations. This is Amrita Rai and Anu Devan's report for Rajya Sabha TV. In News at 10, we'll take a very short uh, break. Up next, we'll have all the international news, all the details on the Israeli, the death of uh, former Israeli Prime Minister and President Shimon Peres. That and much more. Stay with us. Tales that inspire. Stories of social change. A salute to diversity. Promoting public discourse. Events that motivate. Inspiring the innovative spirit. Watch Rajya Sabha television documentaries. Welcome back. Uh, news uh, from down south. Well, the Supreme Court on Tuesday asked it cannot cut to release 6,000 cusicks of Kaveri River water to Tamil Nadu in three days. Now, reserving uh, is a reaction to the Supreme Court's directions. Karnataka Chief Minister said that he would consult legal experts and he maintained that drinking water is a priority for his state. On Tuesday, the Supreme Court sternly ordered Karnataka to release 6,000 Q6 of Kaveri water to neighbouring Tamil Nadu for the next three days. Reserving his reaction to the Supreme Court's direction, Karnataka Chief Minister Siddharamaya said that he would consult legal experts, maintaining that drinking water is a priority. According to sources, the Chief Minister has convened a meeting of floor leaders of both the Houses, MPs and legislators and district in charge ministers today to take stock of the fresh development. I have to speak to my legal team and the technical experts and also other people. Without talking to them, it is not... I will talk to them. In Tamil Nadu, Chief Minister Jayalalitha held a meeting with ministers and top officials at Chennai's Apollo Hospital where she is admitted since last week. The meeting was to discuss her government's response to the ongoing dispute. She has now deputed the state's Public Works Department Minister to attend a meeting on her behalf with Karnataka Chief Minister Siddhara Maya as ordered by the Supreme Court. The court has ordered the meeting by Friday. Supreme Court has... Uh... Uh, condemn the Karnataka government, the verdict of the uh, Supreme Court should be respected. That is the uh, message which we were also requesting. Earlier, Karnataka continued to argue that it cannot release water. The government claims that its cities are in danger of running out of drinking water while promising to spare water for Tamil Nadu only in December. We appeal to the Supreme Court again saying that it is not possible to comply with the uh, order of the Supreme Court uh, as there is no sufficient water. This is a situation where the people of Karnataka are in huge distress. So that, that is why we, we have gone ahead with this modified petition requesting them to modify their order, looking at the ground realities. And also we are requesting, we are saying that we will not, it's not that we are saying we will not release the water. We will, but give us an extension by the end of the season uh, because anyway there may be some more rains. Uh, uh, as, as, uh, as and when the rains come, by the end of the season, by December, we will release the required quota of water. The division of the Kaveri water that originates in Karnataka but flows into Tamil Nadu has locked both states in a conflict for several decades. But the latest agitation began on 5th of September when the Supreme Court agreed that Tamil Nadu should get more water than it had been receiving so far to help its farmers. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV.
Well, on to some other news. Uh, lauding the progress achieved uh, so far on the GST implementation, Finance Minister Arun Jaitley on Tuesday executed confidence that it is reasonably possible to meet the 1st of April next year deadline to roll out the new indirect tax regime. And noting that states have realized the importance of competitiveness and attracting investments, Jaitley said that getting the GST through was troublesome as it involved completely changing the powers of the union and the states. The GST Council has um, the mandate to look into issues of uh, dual control and threshold rates uh, with the states demanding that they be given the legal and administrative powers for imposing tax on entities with a turnover of up to 1.5 crore rupees. The GST Council met on 21st and 22nd of September and decided on many issues barring the rates on which they will meet from 17th of October and they hope to finalise by November. The GST Council is chaired by Arun Jaitley and has his junior in charge of the Revenue and State Finance Ministers as members. Meanwhile, the government is planning to introduce GST legislation, Central GST and Integrated GST in the winter session of Parliament that starts in November. And Finance Minister Arun Jaitley on Tuesday also said that the amendments to the Prevention of Corruption Act will give more room to public servants, including bank officials, to take decisions confidently. He said uh, that the law which deals with accountability of public servants is in the final stage of its amending process. It is before the Standing Committee and, uh, and uh, he hoped that in the next session it comes up. Jaitley, while addressing SBI's banking and economics conclave in Mumbai, also said that the lack of decision-making and consensus is hampering banks. On to some international news. Well, it was the most watched presidential debate in history, which saw flamboyant Donald Trump forced on the defensive by Democratic rival Hillary Clinton for much of the 90-minute showdown at Hofstra University. But uh, with the two more debates still to go and also the unpredictable nature of the 2016 presidential campaign so far, pundits say that Trump can still make a comeback ahead of the 8th of November U.S. presidential election. I think Donald just criticized me for preparing for this debate. And yes, I did. And you know what else I prepared for? I prepared to be president. And I think that's a good thing. One of the hotly contested moments of the first of the three U.S. record 84 million Americans at home saw not only arguments on various policy issues, but was full of personal attacks as well. She doesn't have the look. She doesn't have the stamina. I said she doesn't have the stamina. And I don't believe she does have the stamina. To be president of this country, you need tremendous stamina. One of the worst things he said was about a woman in a beauty contest. He called this woman Miss Piggy. Then he called her Miss Housekeeping because she was Latina. A CNN poll taken after the debate found that 62% of the voters who had watched the head-to-head -head thought that Democratic Hillary Clinton came out on top with just 27% giving it to Republican Donald Trump. It was a clear win for Hillary Clinton or perhaps a clear loss for Donald Trump may be the best way to put it. With the truth, even arguing with the moderator when the moderator caught him on a falsehood that he was always against going into Iraq. He didn't have any grasp of policy or details. He showed himself to have a very thin temperament. Worse for Donald Trump, the billionaire businessman was being seen as a bad loser after he accused moderator Lester Holt of being tougher on him and complained that his microphone was terrible and crackled and that his volume was lower than Hillary's microphone. Oh, I was a little bit upset that the microphone in the room wasn't working properly. What do you mean? Uh, the microphone in the room wasn't working. Despite being much talked about all over the world, most of the Americans expressed discontent with the debate, saying that there was less emphasis on policy issues. Again, some of their behavior is a bit childish, um, maybe uh, unfounded, and I think they focus on, on minutia rather than um, really getting to answers on the key facts that you know we need to address. The debate with 84 million viewers fell short of the 100 million viewers some had predicted but broke the record of 80.6 million viewers who had tuned in for the 1980 presidential debate between Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. 
This debate may have knocked Donald Trump sideways, but not out of the race for the White House. Experts say the unpredictable nature of 2016 race leaves much to be decided with two more debates in October. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Looking forward uh, to the next two debates as well. Meanwhile, more news from the US. Uh, the senators there will cast their vote today to override President Barack Obama's veto of legislation on the Saudi 9-11 bill. The bill would allow the families of the victims of the September 11, 2001 attacks to sue the Saudi Arabian government. Now, this is going to be the first action by an attempt uh, by the lawmakers to override Obama's uh, 23rd of September veto of the justification against uh, sponsors of terrorism act. A successful override requires the support from two-thirds of the lawmakers in both the Senate and House of Representatives, which are controlled by Republicans. In the 9-11 attack, 15 of the 19 hijackers were Saudi nationals. On to the other top international story, well, a former Israeli Prime Minister and President Shimon Peres has died. Now aged 93, Peres had suffered a stroke two weeks ago and his condition improved before a sudden deterioration on Tuesday. Now one of Israel's uh, defining political figures, Peres, was one of the last of the generation of Israeli politicians present at uh, the new nation's birth in 1948. He was one of the key architects of the Oslo Peace Accords for hit for which he was jointly awarded the Nobel Peace Prize with the then Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and Yasir Arafat, who was the chairman of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. First elected to the Israeli Parliament in 1959, Peres' cabinet uh, roles included uh, the defense, finance, and foreign affairs portfolios before he served two brief periods as the Prime Minister. He also became the country's president, serving a seven-year term from 2007 to 2014. Even after his presidential term ended, Peres remained a high-profile figure who continued to make interventions on the country's political direction. Well, some more international stories in World Wrap. Suicide bombers have killed at least 17 people and wounded more than 50 in Shia areas of the Iraqi capital, Baghdad. The Islamic State group said that it carried out both the attacks. A bomber killed at least eight people and wounded 29 in Jadida district. At least nine were dead and 30 were injured in another attack in Baya area. The Islamic State has intensified bomb attacks in government-held areas this year as it loses territory to US-backed Iraqi government forces and Iranian-backed Shiite militias. The United States has appointed its first ambassador to Cuba in 55 years as relations between the countries thaw. US President Barack Obama said it was a step towards more normal and productive relationship. The new ambassador, Jeffrey De Laurentiis, had been working at the new US embassy in Havana, which opened in July last year. President Obama and Cuba's President Raul Castro have begun to reignite the diplomatic relations that were broken off in 1961 after the Caribbean island's communist revolution. The US has a pledge to provide $364 million more in humanitarian aid to people affected by the war in Syria. The funds will help the United Nations and other charities provide food, safe water and medical care to those in the country and refugees in the region. Meanwhile, Syrian forces have made advances in the center of Aleppo after days of heavy strikes. And the World Health Organization has called for safe evacuation routes out of the city for the injured and the sick. And the Sri Lankan police have exhumed the body of a prominent newspaper editor as part of a new investigation into his murder. Lasantha Vikram Matunge was the editor of the Sunday Leader, which was a critical of the then president Mahinda Rajapakse. Well, that's it from me and my team in this edition of News. But news and updates continue on Rajasabha TV. Thanks for watching.